hands mm. because once she saw in the common bulkhead to uh, recover the schedule. This has been a, uh, an unparalleled tragedy in the U.S. space program today. We would like to remind you that our Live at 5 program is coming up next. We will have more information for you at 5.30. Then the ABC uh, news program for the evening. We'll be back with you this evening at 6 o'clock with even more reaction from the Johnson Space Center, Clear Lake area. And then tonight at 9 p.m. Houston time, an hour-long special from the ABC television network. The ABC News Department will give us the latest that they have on this tragedy. We will follow that at 10 o'clock with an expanded eyewitness news program from 10 to 11 tonight, the very latest we have on this tragedy. Thank you for being with us and stay tuned. I sold out, all right, Will, I sold out. You twist the truth. He lied to you because of me. It tears apart the weak. You can make me back. It takes the place of passion. You're not getting human on me, are you? It turns those who have everything. You think it's all some kind of game, don't you? Into those who will stop at nothing. I want to destroy him now. Power. Nothing else comes close. Rated R. Starts Friday. Check newspapers for theaters. Did you say fish fillets that really look like fish fillets? Even though we're all living at the beginning of the space age, and now for <laughs> TV, you can get Lenny D's just for me. Did I hear? Anyone who can do that launch. We have Nancy Holland spent the day at Johnson Space Center. She has word now from. Uh, from uh, Johnson Space Center about what has been going on during this day of sadness. Felicia, late this afternoon, NASA made the first official announcement saying simply that it was with great regret that the agency announced that apparently the crew of the Challenger had not survived. Brothers, is it healthy? Everyone had known. The question now is why? It is a question that may take a very long time to answer. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. The launch looked perfect. The shuttle Challenger lifted off from the pad and climbed into clear skies. Even the transmissions were routine, but just one minute and 12 seconds later, the so-called picture-perfect launch turned into a tragedy. Challenger, go and throttle up. One minute, 15 seconds, velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. It was described as a giant, tragic fireworks display. Plumes of smoke trailed away and chunks of the shuttle fell into the ocean. Rescue ships and paramedics were on the scene almost immediately. The paramedics jumping into the water, hoping to find that by some miracle, someone survived. No one really believed that would be the case. What ended in tragedy began as routine. Good morning, Dick. Let's hope we go today. Astronauts climbed aboard the Challenger, eager for the mission. It was a mission delayed by weather, and then again by a hatch bolt that wouldn't come loose. As is often the case, there was humor. Ground crew members handed Krista McAuliffe an apple, an apple for the crew member who was to be the first teacher in space. While the astronauts waited aboard the Challenger, there was another delay. Cold weather at the launch site caused icicles to form, and workers spent an hour getting rid of the ice before the Challenger was cleared to take off for its space mission. Within moments of the tragedy, there were slow motion pictures of the fireball and hours of silence by NASA as officials tried to answer the question, why? I am aware and have seen the media is showing footage of the launch today from the NASA select system. We will not speculate as to the specific cause of the explosion based on that footage. NASA says it will collect all the debris it can find from the ocean and then undertake the painstaking process of literally putting together the pieces to see what happened. No one knows how long it will take for that investigation to be complete, possibly weeks, possibly months. But until then, the shuttle program is on hold. NASA says it will not fly again until it can do so safely. 
Of course, the astronauts and teacher Krista McAuliffe trained for the mission here in Houston. Norm Ewell reports on the mood here at the Johnson Space Center. NASA is like a small town, population 9,000. There is a sense of family here, and today the family of NASA lost seven of their own. It is silent here as employees walk around in shock, shedding tears and asking what went wrong. Here in building 9A, the feeling of grief seems strongest. This is where the astronauts and teacher Krista McAuliffe did their training, and these are the people who trained them. Privately, employees talk of their grief, their disbelief, but officially, they can say nothing. Elsewhere, it was business as usual. The tours went on as scheduled, many of the tourists not knowing what had happened. I'm just devastated at the news. I don't know what to say. Well, I suppose sooner or later it had to happen. It's too bad it did that. So all, all those successful flights and now this. But. The first official sign that NASA held no hope for survivors came in the early afternoon when the flag here was lowered to half staff. I have, uh, as we all have been out there numerous times, and I suspect that neither of you has ever seen the Space Center to be quite as, uh, for want of a better word, down than it is today. Is that right? No, I haven't, Steve. Uh, it was very quiet. You know, you've, you've heard people use the phrase, the, 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 the silence was deafening. That, that was the sense that I got today. It was, people weren't talking. They were just uh, walking around with their heads down. Um, just thinking, uh, trying to think through it all, I guess, I guess uh, trying to make some sense of it all, which, which of course they can't. Nancy, I talked to you much earlier in the day, half an hour, 45 minutes after this disaster, and uh, there was not much of anything going on right, right then. I wonder if that has changed at all during the day. Do you see people moving into oh, to situations where they're going to try to set it and find out what's going on or what went on today, what happened? Well, of course, I think there's going to be an, a massive effort to find out what happened here. Already there has been an interim investigating team that has been formed. All of the notes on this mission, all of the tapes, all of the recordings, all of that has already been taken and then put in a safe place so it can be painstakingly studied over a period of time. Uh, it is obviously something that is going to take a very long time to do because the, the people here at NASA, there's two things that are, that are very important to remember. It is very much a family here. Uh, it isn't spoken of in terms of a corporation. This is something we do. Everybody here, in a sense, goes on every one of those missions. And everyone here is very proud of the safety record that NASA has had. And it is a very, very personal thing with the people here. They yes. want to find out what went wrong so it will never go wrong again. And we, as reporters, sometimes tend to get wrapped up in this whole thing, too. As, as well we might. I wonder if uh, anybody at NASA there has come by to you and said, look, get this part of the story across to the American people, to your viewers or whatever. Well, I think that, that it does come across uh, to everyone, the, the sense of belonging that everyone has here. And I, I think that maybe Norm uh, can speak about this too. It is probably the most difficult story to feel uh, any sort of objectivity about it because sure it's, it's an American story and, and we feel a part of it. We sure do. And, and uh, speaking about, uh, we, I didn't have anybody ask me to get this you know, particular portion out, whatever. Uh, but the employees here were told not to talk to the media, and I think that was not so... And, I, and from my story point of view, we were looking at the family aspect. I think part of that is that they're trying to figure out what happened before they, they let all of these speculation uh, get out and go every which direction. Uh, they wanted to do a thorough investigation and find out what happened so that they can get it back on a safe track. And they don't want any, any speculation at this point. As indeed to, it, to is, uh, it is dangerous for any of us to speculate. Norm and Nancy, thank you for both uh, very much. Just looking at something totally different. Uh, especially to reporters. That's a side that they rarely let show to the public. It's something that is just rarely ever talked about. But I think it's, uh, it's something that certainly everyone does think about and talk about with their close associates and people that you spend time with on the weekends or whenever you do have time off at this place. All right, Susan Starnes, thank you very much. Shock of the nation is felt very keenly around the Space Center at Clear Lake. Let's go now to uh, Dave Walker, who's standing by down at Clear Lake. David? Ron, I'm in the geographical center of the town here at uh, Bay Area Boulevard in El Camino Real, but you know the heart of this city is really NASA. Everybody out here either works there, they're an astronaut, they're an engineer, they're a wife, they're one of the children, or perhaps they work at one of the businesses that supports it, or just one of the businesses in town. As you could imagine, everyone here is taking this tragedy very personally. 
It is not just any city, it's Clear Lake, home of NASA's astronauts, home of genuine American heroes. Two minutes into the shuttle mission number 25, the whole town went into mourning. This morning I came out and I put it in half mass. Somewhere they're up there with the good Lord. Peg Naples' husband and her son both worked for NASA. For 25 years now, she has held her breath every time a rocket has launched men into space. We're all upset about it, and naturally the whole nation is, I'm sure. Flags all over Clear Lake are flying at half-mast. These astronauts were not just heroes here. They were neighbors. And it seems as though you just meet everyone's eyes, and it's like everybody understands. It's, it's that type of community, and you know that just about everybody here is affiliated with NASA one way or another. The grief many people feel here is born privately. It's hard for some to express their feelings. All agree, though, this tragedy will increase their anxiety the next time a shuttle takes one of their neighbors into space. It's right from the beginning. It's always been we knew something would be happening at some time. It's just like a test pilot. And, uh, but somebody has to do it and wants to do it. Ron, as a reporter, I'm sure you've uh, run into this also. Uh, sometimes during these tragedies, someone hasn't heard. You have to explain it to them. Well, today it's been my experience that I found no one who hasn't heard what's happened. I haven't found anyone who hasn't been emotional about it, who hasn't shed a tear. All right, Dave Walker. Thank you very much. Dave Walker down at uh, Clear Lake City. The uh, tragic events this morning certainly hit home uh, here in Houston, a city proud of its longstanding tradition with NASA. Our B.B. Burns found that uh, most people were simply stunned by the news. It has been a especially tragic day for the nation, especially here in Houston, Space City. No chance. Rupture. And you can see in that picture the shuttle itself continuing, but on a very irregular path, and it crashed minutes later into the Atlantic Ocean, about four minutes offshore. Well, I just feel heartstroken for the people, for the family, for the young. Just thinking about the children. <laughs> I can't really talk about it, really, when I think about it. It was that kind of emotion that surfaced in homes all over the city. A nagging frustration, a sense of helplessness, mixed with a feeling that despite the tragedy, the space program has to go on. You know, it's a terrible thing to lose people, and, uh, but everything has a risk. And as far as doing uh, more space shots, I think that we have to. At electronic stores all over the city, stunned shoppers stopped to watch TV news reports. Everyone was silent. Everyone knew something was wrong. Everywhere, people seemed to be privately mourning, remembering other tragedies that brought us together. You know, it was awful. You know, I really couldn't believe it at the time. It, it did remind me of when, when Jack Kennedy was, was assassinated almost, just the feeling about everybody, you know, yeah. King Cobra is the only malt liquor that's so good when the taste grabs it. It's a different... Man, what a terrible day. Almost crazy. It shook me up at first. I was stunned. I didn't think anything could happen. But it did happen. And like Bob said, you know, they were just paving the way for the future. And that, of course, was a group of sixth graders from Deer Park Junior High who happened to come out here today on a field trip. Of course, they chose a tragic day to come here, and NASA is trying their best to continue business as usual here. But, Bob, I would say the best description for what is being felt here is extreme shock right now. Bob? Uh, to say the least, Jim, thank you for that report. And, uh, Shara, as you've heard, uh, everybody, well, understandably down and, and just wondering why, 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 and the answers are forthcoming in an investigation, although that probably won't satisfy the emotions for a very, very long period of time. NASA not only lost coworkers, a lot of friends died in that explosion today. We definitely need to point that out, that especially here in Houston and Clear Lake, these were our friends, our neighbors. You knew some of the astronauts. Yes, I did. knew Ellison Onosuka. And uh, it is a, a terrible loss. And I think maybe, Bob, we should take a look at the people who were aboard that space shuttle today. And right now, Stone Phillips has more about the crew of the Challenger. Okay. Challenger's crew <laughs> trained for this mission for nearly a year. The spacecraft commander, Francis Scobie, age 46, born and raised in Washington State, became a NASA astronaut in 1979 after 22 years in the Air Force, including combat tour in Vietnam. Scobie earned the Air Force Distinguished Flying Cross and Air Medal. As a test pilot, he logged more than 5,300 hours in some 40 different aircraft. 
This was Scobie's second shuttle mission. He is survived by his wife and two children. Challenger's pilot on this 25th shuttle launch was Michael Smith, age 40, a decorated Navy pilot from North Carolina, who became a shuttle astronaut in 1980. This was his first mission. He is survived by his wife and three children. Mission specialist Judy Resnick became an astronaut in 1978. Her specialty, electrical engineering. This was her second shuttle mission. She had logged 144 hours, 57 minutes in space. Ronald McNair, age 36, also a mission specialist, was selected as an astronaut in 1979. He too was a veteran of the shuttle, making his first shuttle flight in 1984, bringing his background in physics and laser technology to the program. The third mission specialist on today's launch was Air Force Colonel Ellison Onizuka, age 39, born in Hawaii. A former aerospace engineer and pilot, he had taught at the elite Air Force Test Pilot School in California. He became a NASA astronaut in 1979. Onizuka was on his second shuttle mission. His initial flight in 1984 was the first dedicated to the Department of Defense. He was married with two children. Gregory Jarvis, a payload specialist, age 41, was a Hughes aircraft engineer on board to conduct tests on the effects of weightlessness on fluids carried in tanks. Born in Detroit, trained as an Air Force satellite engineer, this was Jarvis's first shuttle mission. He is survived by his wife. And finally, Krista McAuliffe, age 37, the social studies teacher from New Hampshire, the first private citizen selected to fly aboard the shuttle. She'd been chosen from more than 11,000 applicants nationwide. She survived by her husband, two children, and the students in Concord, New Hampshire. Our Deborah Wrigley has spent the day in the community where many of these astronauts live. She's been talking to their neighbors, and she is live right now in Webster. Deborah, Shara, it can be said that the entire country is in mourning for the seven souls aboard Challenger, but it carries an especially hard blow. Here in Nassau Bay, in Webster, in the Clear Lake area, all the places where every astronaut calls at least temporary home. There is shock, disbelief here from everyone and outside of the families. No one feels the loss of these crew members more profoundly than their friends and their neighbors and we introduce you now to a pair of them we just couldn't believe what happened it was just from being thrilled and jumping up and down and clapping and say go well to just tragedy Today, Barbara Spencer and her husband, Frank, were to watch their next-door neighbor embark on a second shuttle mission. They returned home to Clear Lake this morning from Florida, though, frustrated by the numerous shuttle delays, only to watch mission specialist Ellison Onizuka apparently perish with the rest of the Challenger crew. There are reminders, mementos, from shuttle paraphernalia to more personal souvenirs. Pictures Barbara took of the astronaut they nicknamed L and wife Lorna at his homecoming from his previous top secret shuttle mission. Now tragedy without foreshadowing, except perhaps for what Lorna Onizuka told her friend this weekend. She said, we had a briefing on the, the little black book. And I said, what is the little black book? And she said, it's what we're supposed to refer to in case of, uh, what was the word? Oh, an accident or, or any kind of catastrophe. A catastrophe. A catastrophe. A catastrophe. Just for a second, you could tell that, that she had some reservations. Yeah, I think that it made her possibly think of the possible problems that could yeah. come up. And the Spencers now uh, plan to get a funeral wreath for the front door of their neighbor's home. You, you can see things like that going on all around Clear Lake, on, on every street where every astronaut called his, or in, in two cases, their homes. And uh, the flags half-staff around, around the Clear Lake area in Nassau Bay, that is at the governor's order. But it's really, it's taken up by the municipalities here as well. Again, it's a simple period of mourning here in the Clear Lake area. Back to you, Shira. Certainly for all of us. Thank you, Deborah. Governor White was here in Houston when he called for the flags to be flown at half staff. We'll be back to tell you a little bit more about that as well as get some analysis from a former astronaut. So stay with us. I'm a salad person. Fruit, chicken, especially pasta salad. But they have to taste fresh. So when I saw new Fresh Chef salads in the dairy case, I was curious. How fresh would they taste? This is Fresh Chef's seafood pasta. 
It's incredible. Pasta, crab meat, shrimp. If the other salads are even half as good, I may never slice, dice, chop, or shred again. New Fresh Chef salads in the dairy case taste fresh enough to call your own. And now, the finance program you've been waiting for. Cadillac announces 7.9% financing on Cadillac DeVille's and Fleetwood's. 7.9% financing that can save you thousands of dollars in interest payments. Save over $2,000 in interest alone. 7.9% will not last long. It may be the best time of year to buy a Cadillac. Don't miss out. See your greater Houston area Cadillac dealer today. Won't be needing my famous bread recipe anymore. Because now Rainbow's got these new family recipe spreads. They're good and wholesome, just like mine. Take the split top wheat with the top split right before baking. Real butter poured in at just the right touch of honey. Mmm! But does family recipes taste as good as my famous recipe? Uh, don't answer that. Introducing Rainbow Family Recipes. Our recipe never tasted better. If you think this is an ordinary wrap, keep watching. Because this is new Glad Microwave Wrap. And this test will convince you it's no ordinary wrap. We made new Glad Microwave Wrap so heat resistant you can cook on it. So you know this wrap is made to take the heat of your microwave cooking. It's Bosley's Law. For better microwave cooking, why take chances? Get new Glad Microwave Wrap. Former astronaut Gene Cernan serves as a space expert for ABC News on most other shuttle missions. He is with our Sylvan Rodriguez right now with more reaction to today's disaster. Sylvan. Gene, you've gone through this before, uh, the tragedy that occurred on Apollo 1. How does NASA recover from something like that? Well, it's stronger, certainly, uh, but not easily. It, 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 there's a lot of grief, as you've heard in the community, uh, grief that I think extends throughout this nation of ours. Uh, but, but NASA will learn from it. Uh, we will learn technologically. We will learn what the problems are and, and uh, I think be better for that. I, I, I really do believe that. You've seen the videotape um, and from that we can tell certain things. Now with the model that we have here in hand, you saw the spark that occurred between the orbiter and the fuel tank. What does that tell you? Well, you know, the only data we have uh, is what we saw from one single camera, and I'm sure there were many cameras uh, watching this, uh, cameras that are going to be analyzed very thoroughly. There was a spark, I say a spark, we saw a flash of light uh, somewhere around the nose of the, uh, of the, of the shuttle between it and the tank. Uh, it may have contributed uh, uh, to the problem, it may not. I would like to review, for instance, other space shuttle flights mm -hmm. that may be a common occurrence on all the flights. Mm -hmm. Now, we do know that at that point, uh, about one minute and 15 seconds into after a launch, that the craft does come through a max Q, that is maximum aerodynamic pressure. Explain to us why that is such a dangerous period. Well, if you want to pinpoint a couple areas in that launch that are very critical, uh, just the lift off of the pad until things get going, you know, the motor gets started and you're underway, that's one. And certainly max dynamic pressure, that's where the airspeed and the density of the air combine to make the, the maximum pressure forces, if you will, on the on the spacecraft, on the wings, uh, if they're going to rattle, they're going to rattle then. Uh, once you get through that point, things smooth out. It's almost like you went through some kind of barrier. Uh, I can remember uh, way back when John Young said one time on a Gemini program, now we're beginning to haul the mail. Th things get quiet after that. You get all that air pressure behind you. That is a critical point, and that's the point at which it's occurred. And it is amazing they were just seconds away from coming out of that critical point when that explosion occurred. Shara, back to you. Thank you, Sylvan, and Gene Cernan as well. President Reagan had planned to present his State of the Union address to the nation tonight on television, but instead this afternoon, the president's message was about today's tragedy. This is truly a national loss. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. We'll go at the the crew of the shuttle. Houston, who was a PhD researcher who decided she wanted to go fly in space, signed up and became America's second woman to go. Ron McNair is, uh, was, was quite a character. Ron was the man who could play saxophone. Uh, he's a fifth degree black belt in karate.
and who could also wax elo eloquently about the beauty of space, saying that the highlight of his life up until uh, 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 the highlight of his life was his first space flight, when after years and years of studying physics and astrophysics, he found himself out there right in the middle of it all, just surrounded by all of reality. Krista McAuliffe, of course, a school teacher who believes sincerely that the, uh, the space program was a key to furthering education. And Greg Jarvis, ironically aboard this mission, he had been scheduled to go twice before, but was bumped for politicians to fly, first Senator Jake Garn and then uh, Congressman Bill Nelson of Florida. He said he had no problems with that. He was just happy to go. Dick Scobie was a man, though, who would want everyone to know, I'm sure, that regardless of any tragedy in the shuttle program, he would believe that the space shuttle should continue to fly, that the space station should be developed. He was kind enough to invite me down here this time as one of his guests. Scobie uh, had talked to me several times about the fact that in all of these shuttle missions, I had never had the opportunity to see one of uh, the shuttles lift off the pad. And he said, you know, it's time for you to get there. I want you to come down and be one of our guests. And we had the privilege of uh, getting to know each other a little bit. As we stood along the road today, uh, it was it, everything appeared normal. Then suddenly there was just a giant fireball, and it was gone. The shuttle program is on hold. The whole program is in shock, I'm sure, and all of his friends are in shock. But uh, from a personal standpoint, allow me to say, if I could in their behalf, that I know that if they could say one final thing, they'd say, keep them flying. Chip? John, those of us who watched it on television, uh, I think have to ask you, what did it look like in person? You were standing I'm sorry, there. if you were talking to me, I can't hear you at this point. OK. Uh, John Getter reporting live tonight from uh, Cape Canaveral. An eyewitness to the tragedy today, and uh, we hope to get back to John a little bit later on, and perhaps uh, on our late show tonight at 10 o'clock. Uh, former astronaut Wall, Wednesday was involved. Only discount coupons at New Car Dealer. Has test flown some of the shuttles. Spoke with the 11 News reporter Philip Bruce this morning, and here are some of his. today as well. Oh, absolutely. And uh, it's different. Everybody. Whether we'll see that, we don't. Of course, an entire blackout has just about been imposed on uh, on any information, uh, any details uh, that may come in. And I just think that at this point, they want no one in that area and they want no pictures out of from that area. Uh, and of course, they couldn't get in there for at least an hour uh, after the actual uh, explosion because debris was still falling from a height of at least 50,000 feet. Uh, so there was general concern for safety of the ships that were out there just standing by to recover SRBs and to keep uh, other ships out of the area on just a, a normal launch day. But at this point, no, I really can't say why we have not been provided with any NASA pictures of the air, except maybe that it is just such a huge, enormous area. And they, they say they have not actually recovered any pieces, that they have just seen pieces from the air and that the ships are on their way to pick them up. And that's, that's where it stands right now here at the Kennedy Space Center, Lou. All right, John Zarella, now to M.A. in New York. Across the nation today, Americans stopped what they were doing as news of the shuttle disaster spread. They rushed to radios and television sets trying to grasp the unfolding tragedy. CNN's Sandy Kenyon takes a look at how the media covers a breaking story like this. After two dozen successful missions, shuttle flights had become so routine, none of the three major broadcast networks bothered to interrupt their regular programming for live coverage of this most recent launch. Only CNN and some local stations were actually carrying the picture from Cape Canaveral at 11.38 in the morning Eastern Time. But within minutes, anchormen at CBS, NBC, and ABC were at their desks, and once again, Americans were watching a national tragedy unfold on television. From the neighborhood bar, all the way to the White House. We immediately adjourned our Oval Office meeting and went into an adjoining uh, room, the President's study, where there's a television, and the President then began to review television reports of the uh, explosion there shortly after the launch. 
The era when most Americans suffer a tragedy together by means of television began with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in 1963. It's often referred to as the moment when TV news came of age, because for the first time we were able to witness for ourselves live the killing of Kennedy's suspected assassin Lee Harvey Oswald, the return of his body to Washington, and later his funeral. In 1968, another Kennedy brother was killed, and when Robert Kennedy went down in a Los Angeles hotel corridor, TV cameras arrived on the scene almost immediately afterwards. With improved technology came the ability to cover a story live from overseas. Satellites brought us news of the capture of Americans by Iranians, and even spawned a new program which grew into a show called Nightline. Pictures of the unthinkable, an attack on the Pope, were seen in the United States shortly after it occurred. Television's capabilities have sparked a debate. When does the medium cease to become an observer and instead become a participant? Case in point, the hijacking of a TWA flight in the Middle East, when terrorists use television to state their case directly to the American public. But despite the criticisms of TV, Rudy, this juicy it's certain to continue to act as the national clearinghouse for information about a tragedy, as well as a forum. When something like people don't go. This uh, showbiz today will not be seen in its usual time slot tonight, so that we may bring you this special edition of Newswatch, which continues in just a moment. June Allen. Afraid, decaffeinate your smile. New Caffrey. What do you take? What happened? Charlie. Charlie. Oh, no. Charlie. Charlie, please don't. Charlie. Oh, baby, come on, take him away. <laughs> Peter the Great. An epic world space accident later in the newscast, as well as a special report that's scheduled for 6.30 this evening. While the Challenger tragedy is the major news story of the day, there is other news to report today. We will do that in just a moment. Time takes its toll. And Maximilian shells. But around the we will be, as uh, Cher has said, uh, expanding Eyewitness News tonight at 10 o'clock. Up next, ABC World News Tonight with more on the shuttle tragedy. Throttling up, three engines now at 104%. Challenger, go at throttle up. The space shuttle Challenger is destroyed just a little more than one minute after liftoff. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical. All seven astronauts on board are killed. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Tonight, reporting from Washington. It is the worst disaster in the history of the American space program, and President Reagan has declared a week of mourning for the seven astronauts, five men and two women, who lost their lives on their way into space this morning. Now, we know that many of you have heard the news many hours ago and may even have seen some of our extended coverage this afternoon. But many others of you, we surmise, have been at work, and thus we're going to spend virtually our entire broadcast this evening on what is not only a crushingly sad... Oh, ...so cruel, so unexpected, that we're still trying to deal with it. The victims. Flight Commander Francis Dick Scobie. He'd flown in Vietnam. He was 46 years old. He leaves a wife and two children. Navy Commander Michael Smith, the pilot, also saw action in Vietnam, 40 years old. He leaves a wife and three children. Mission Specialist Ronald McNair, a physicist, was 36 years old, a wife, and two children. Lieutenant Colonel Ellison Anazuka was an Air Force test pilot, 39 years old. He leaves a wife and two children. Electrical engineer Dr. Judith Resnick, 36 years old, a veteran astronaut. She was single. Payload Specialist Gregory Jarvis was an engineer for Hughes Aircraft, 41 years old. He leaves a wife. And, of course, the seventh crew member. New Hampshire school teacher Krista McAuliffe, 37 years old. She leaves a husband and two children. They died today in the worst accident ever to befall space explorers anywhere. NBC's Dan Molina was covering the launch from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. It was a bitter cold but sparkling clear morning at Cape Canaveral. Here at the last seconds of the countdown. Four, three, two, one, and liftoff. 
liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. All the communications between the shuttle and mission control indicated everything was going fine. There was a sense of relief that the much-delayed flight was finally underway. Engines at 65 percent, three engines uh, running normally, three good fuel cells, three good APUs. Engines throttling up, three engines now at 104 percent. Challenger, go at throttle up. It happened just over one minute into flight. One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, nine nautical miles. Downrange distance, seven nautical miles. From mission control, silence. Then the bland, chilling report. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Slow motion. A search effort couldn't begin for some 15 minutes after this. Debris, they said, just kept raining from the sky. The head of the space shuttle program had no explanations, just sorrow at the tragedy. At 11.40 a.m. this morning, space program experienced a national tragedy with the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger approximately a minute and a half after launch from here at the Kennedy Space Center. Computer-enhanced video shows the explosion in detail. What explosion appears to happen at the rear of the spacecraft, around the main engines, perhaps in one of the two solid rocket boosters? Then a blast higher up. The shuttle was instantly a blazing fireball. NASA has appointed a committee of top engineers and scientists to investigate the catastrophe. Orders have been issued to impound all records concerning the flight, down to the personal notes of all the flight controllers. Dan Molina, NBC News at the Johnson Space Center, Houston. And from ground level on Cape Canaveral, today's disaster was witnessed by thousands of people. Among them were space officials, technicians, and the families of the astronauts. Steve Delaney was on the scene to cover the launch for NBC News. The day began in optimism and high spirits after the frustration of yesterday's scrubbed countdown. As the crew suited up to enter the Challenger, one of the technicians there revived an old schoolboy tradition and brought an apple to the teacher. For the McAuliffe family and the families of the other six crew members, this was to be a triumphant day. Grace and Ed Corrigan of Framingham, Massachusetts were in the VIP bleachers along with their daughter Lisa to watch their daughter Krista become the school teacher in space. Their faces mirrored what happened a little more than a minute into the flight. The families have been secluded in the astronauts' quarters at the Space Center since just after the accident. In nearby Titusville, where the manned space program is the economy, the shock hit hard. I just started crying and, and backed up and walked away because I knew it was really bad. I wonder if anybody could be salvaged, you know, from something like that. That was really the first thing that went through my head. Vice President George Bush arrived here late in the day, heading a delegation bearing the nation's condolences to the families. You must try to understand that spirit, bravery, and commitment are what make not only the space program, but all of life worthwhile. We must never as people in our daily lives or as a nation, stop exploring, stop hoping, stop discovering. We must press on. There was a search in the Atlantic, but the searchers found so little that late in the afternoon, NASA conceded there was no indication of survivors. But that conclusion had been foreshadowed an hour earlier when the flag at the launch site was lowered to half staff. Steve Delaney, NBC News at the Kennedy Space Center. NBC science correspondent Robert Bazell has been covering the space shuttle flight since this program began. He's at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Just moments before, Eileen O'Hara, Krista McAuliffe's good friend and classroom substitute, had shared this haunting sentiment with a local reporter. Yeah, it's going to be hard to watch because <laughs> I want her to be safe and I want her to have fun. Now the public celebration had turned into private mourning and shock. She was a part of us. She was part of a family. 
and just like if your sister or brother died, she's she'll be remembered. It was the hell, just the hell. Though Krista McAuliffe's students and friends have known her here in Concord for years, she became known to the nation when she decided to pursue her dreams. Those dreams have been One sparked by President Race program, but NASA pressed on, on to the moon, and five Apollo flights later. Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin landed their lunar module on the moon while Michael Collins circled in the main spacecraft. Armstrong was the first to step onto the surface. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. NASA landed crews on the moon five more times. With the U.S. clearly on top in the space race, NASA let military considerations take a back seat for a while and concentrated on science. Skylab, the first U.S. space station, was launched in 1973. Three crews of three astronauts each lived and worked aboard Skylab for a total of 171 days. Secure in their superiority, the U.S. agreed to a joint space mission with the Soviet Union, the Apollo-Soyuz test project. Three American astronauts and two Soviet cosmonauts met in mid-orbit and remained linked for two days to conduct astronomical, medical, and technical experiments. But now, Congress wanted a return on their space investment. Billions of dollars had been poured into NASA coffers, so the space shuttle program was designed as a money-making venture. Business needed the shuttle to launch an increasing number of lucrative satellites. The military wanted the shuttle because of its growing research into space surveillance and later, space weapons. The 70s found NASA researchers back at the drawing board, working almost nonstop to develop this space vehicle that could be launched into space and returned much like an airplane. On November 24, 1980, the first space shuttle rolled out of the hangar. Its name, Columbia. It marked a new era in space exploration. Six months later, Columbia made its first trip into space. The flight lasted just over 54 hours. Since then, three other shuttle crafts have been built, Challenger, Discovery, and Atlantis. With each flight, NASA became more proficient in launching satellites and looked to the future with the construction of a huge robot arm that can lift heavy loads in mid-orbit. NASA's next project, building the first permanent space station by the early 1990s. At least, that was the plan before Challenger's tragedy. Greg Lamott, CNN. Joining Newswatch now in Washington, Congressman Rodney Chandler. Flight engineer, Jarvis was on his first shuttle mission. Coming. Ronald McNair, age 36 from South Carolina, brought a background in physics and laser technology to the shuttle program. This was the second trip to space for a husband and father who saw space travel as a calling for mankind. I see it as something that we must do, and I see it as something that's part of man's nature to explore. These six, along with Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space, now a tragic page in NASA history. Stone Phillips, ABC News. When we come back, we'll try to analyze what happened. It isn't easy. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jett. Counting down with her. the explosion there was confusion was something wrong the principal and teachers weren't certain either then it got very quiet as the horror of it began to register they did go back for a while but at one o'clock school was closed it had to close i felt as if uh, my whole body blew up inside when i saw that and i can just never be as shocked as i am now the students went home while the faculty and principals, Krista McAuliffe's colleagues, tried to collect themselves. We were enjoying the entire event. We were celebrating with her. Then it stopped. That's all. It just stopped. She had talked to her recently, Maylock's plot. It's about reaching for the stars. And now those students, members of the faculty, and her friends are reaching deep within themselves and trying to understand. Her training for the mission was shared with her students. She once told them that space exploration was in the future of every child. It was that kind of positive philosophy that led to her selection. She was one of 10 teachers chosen as finalists. It's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. When she left her husband and two children in New Hampshire for Houston, her six-year-old daughter Caroline wasn't very happy about it. 
Why wasn't she? Because I don't want to go in space because I just want to stay around my house. But she wanted to go for her family, her friends, her students, and the teachers who were runners-up. When that shuttle got, we say, might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be 10 souls that I'm taking with me. Fred Briggs, NBC News, Concord, New Hampshire. Last July, in an interview with New York radio station... ...obviously feeding the fire. Now you will see the flame creeping up the external tank in between the tank and the shuttle itself. This is the beginning of the huge catastrophic explosion that absolutely engulfed the entire system. You will see a second explosion right at the top of that big external tank. This is obviously what put the entire thing into flames and probably what destroyed the shuttle almost instantly. Now for a moment the smoke clears and we see emerging apparently the top of Challenger. We think this is the last picture we have ever seen of Challenger before it fell to the sea with its precious cargo. And as the sequence is going to continue, you will see that mammoth, horrible explosion. On the right, one of the solid rocket boosters split away now from the tank and the shuttle itself. Um, these these uh, boosters cannot be controlled once they're lit, so it has obviously gone off on its own Onto, into the wrong place, but it does not appear, I repeat, appear from what we can say, see that it was the cause of the explosion or that anything happened to it. So that's the sequence. We can see that. We can try to understand it. What we don't know is why it happened, and that's what we now need to find out. Peter? Lynn, thank you very much. Joining us tonight from Houston is the former astronaut Gene Cernan from the Apollo program, and he also has seen this same sequence repeated many times throughout the day. Gene, I know your reluctance to speculate and share it with you, but do you see anything in those pictures which give us a clue? But it's in NASA's safety record. Even Green, I'm glad the scramble from Discovery when liftoff for her first mission was scrubbed because the engine shut down after ignition. Resnick was single, a classical pianist with a PhD in engineering who had found her life's work in space. I'd like to stay with the space program as long as they want me. Um, as an astronaut if I can, and if not, I'd like to stay in some other capacity because I think it's very important. 39-year-old Air Force Colonel Ellison Onizuka was the first Japanese-American in space. He leaves a wife and two children. I'd certainly like to stay in the program as, as, as long as I can, as, as long as I can contribute to it and, uh, and be a part of it. Uh. Challenger pilot Mike Smith, 40, tested planes for the Navy before he became an astronaut. This was his first space mission. Well, I, I am excited, and I, I guess I look at it like I look at flying new airplanes. Uh, long enough. 12-hour space to make it where he grew up. This was Scobie's second shuttle mission, and he put the one. Include Provo. The tragedy as today's was possible. And we do these flights repetitively, and they get kind of a, a commonplaceness to them that's really not there because each one of them is an individual technological marvel in itself, and you lose that by watching so many of them. There are a lot of things that go on during space flight, and it's not easy to do, and, it's, and it may look easy from the outside. It's not easy from the inside. Bob Jamison, NBC News, New York. A footnote about Krista McAuliffe, she received a gift from the space division of Karun and Black, that's a New York insurance broker. That company gave her a $1 million personal accident policy for this shuttle flight. And an official of the company said the money should be paid to the McAuliffe family within a few days. Incredible crowds have been reported at Color Time. Could you tell us why all the excitement at Color Time? Oh, that's easy, darling. It's this. Don't. Sweetie. I just want to die. <laughs> on Payne Walker and that I came. Disney Channel. That's on Payne Walker and that I came after. Discuss not only the tragedy at. Yeah. Big half price sale on right now. <laughs> Just one more routine to go. Oh, no. This one helps keep you fit inside. Fit inside? It's Kellogg's Brand Flakes. You get lots of fiber to help keep your insides fit and running smooth. Oh. And 100% of the iron you need each day. Uh, how do they taste? Really good. Uh, Come on, uh. you'll like this exercise. You just lift the spoon. Ooh. Kellogg's Brand Flakes does the rest. Mm. Kellogg's Brand Flakes. Take care of the inside. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
There's something about Hellman's. Perfect with everything, Hellman's. That you just can't forget. So thick, so luscious. Hellman's real mayonnaise. Bring out the Hellman's and bring out the best. In official Washington today, the reaction has been much the same as anywhere else in the country. Shock and disbelief and sorrow. The president took the unprecedented step of postponing the State of the Union message, which he was due to give to Congress tonight. He will give it next week. He did go on television late this afternoon to comfort the nation. ABC Sam Donaldson at the White House. The flag was lowered at the White House and other government buildings late this afternoon as President Reagan led the nation in mourning with a short address from the Oval Office. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle Challenger. We know we share this pain with all of the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. The day began with the president conferring with congressional leaders about his State of the Union message scheduled for delivery tonight. When he heard the news of the shuttle disaster, his first thought was to go ahead with it. You can't stop governing the nation, Mr. Reagan told a group of reporters. But as the president and his advisors kept watching the television replays of the explosion and the reactions of relatives, school children, and others, Mr. Like Reagan ours. changed his mind. The president thought it was entirely appropriate that uh, his State of the Union uh, be deferred. The state. I hate fighting. You've been known to get in a few yourself, stubborn man. No more. Where will you go? Maybe I'll find Dad. If you did, what would you do? I can't know. You tell me. You could see the mountains and rivers. You could see the cities. You could come back here. Would I be scared there, too? We're all scared a little now and then. I don't like it. I don't either. At all. I know. Don't to go away. I can't. stay here anymore. We'll, we'll write to you. There's nothing left for us here. Ever since the baby... Our parents, we... We have to get away. We'll find a safe place. We won't stop until we do. We'll come back. Just as soon as we can. Good luck. Bye, Carol. Bye, Carol. Six Delta Nova. <laughs>